Good evening. Welcome to the Spring Pearl Performing Arts Center Premier Health Theater. Uh, my name is Janie Ridd and I'm the Deputy Mayor of our city of Springboro. We're delighted you're here and in addition to those of you in the audience, we also have many viewers watching on Facebook Live, so welcome to all of you as well. Thank you so much for being here tonight, we really appreciate it. This evening's presentation is Breast Cancer, Diagnosis, Treatment, and Surgical Options. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for tonight, Dr. Celine Samuel. Dr. Samuel obtained fellowship training in breast surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Akron General Medical Center in Ohio. She received advanced training in nipple sparing mastectomies, non-invasive breast biopsies, the complexities of genetic testing, and the management of high-risk patients. Having trained at the Cleveland Clinic, a renowned tertiary cancer center, she's a strong advocate of multidisciplinary approach to cancer care and the value of integrating holistic approaches. To learn more about Dr. Samuel and Premier Surgical Oncology, please visit premiersurgicaloncology.com. Please join me with a warm welcome for Dr. Celine Samuel. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you everyone for your time today. It's an honor to have this opportunity to share some of my knowledge with you guys, and uh, so I do appreciate it. So this talk really is about breast cancer, how does it get diagnosed, what are some of the treatment and surgical options when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. So some of the topics that we are going to cover, kind of a little bit background about breast cancer itself, what are the statistics that are out there, what risk factors put a woman at risk for breast cancer, some truths and myths about breast cancer, what are the signs and symptoms associated with the disease, and then how is it detected, how is it diagnosed, and then what are some of the treatment options available. Also, we're going to talk about survival, what it entails as far as the survivorship in care, and do women need screening after breast cancer? And if they do, what type of screening should those patients have? All right, so as of May of this year, breast cancer overtook lung cancer as the number one diagnosed malignancy worldwide and the number one diagnosed malignancy in the US. However, although it's number one, it's number two to lung cancer as far as mortality. That means deaths, okay? All right, so one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. And that means by the age of 70. In 2015, it was estimated that about 231,000 women would have been diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. We're not done with 2021 yet, but it is estimated that by the time we reach the closing of this year, that number would have increased by approximately 50,000. And men do get breast cancer, roughly about 2,000 men in 2015. It's estimated that before the end of this year, about 2,600 men will have breast cancer. Unfortunately, approximately 43,000 women will have died from this disease. Although we see a decline in deaths in women over 50, we're still seeing a steady rate in women younger than 50. The mortality rates have significantly decreased. And the reason being because we have new treatment modalities in managing breast cancer. Also, the reason why we've got increased survival with breast cancer is because we are detecting the disease early on. What are some of the risk factors? Older age, unfortunately can't change it. Wish I could, I'd still be 21. Being a woman, I don't wanna change it. There's so many more advantages to being a woman than it is to being a man, i.e. multitasking. Family history, having a gene mutation. There are certain types of benign breast diseases that increase a woman's risk for breast cancer. So some patients will show up and say, hey, my doctor said it was benign, why am I seeing you? because although it's benign, it has an increased risk associated with it for that woman getting breast cancer in the future. Also having a previous history of breast cancer increases a woman's risk for breast cancer in the future. Early periods, late menopause, late age at first birth, and that's just related to hormone exposure, okay? Having had radiation in the past of the chest wall, there are certain types of cancers, i.e. cancers of the blood, 
where patients, part of the treatment requires radiation. We know that radiation can cause cancer. Being overweight or obese increases the risk for breast cancer. We'll talk about that. And newly parity basically means in English, not ever having kids. All right, what can be controlled? Meaning what can we not control that is a risk factor? Can't control your age. Can't change your family or your personal history. Can't change who you are. Can't change the fact that you got radiation to survive a previous condition. Can't change your genetics. Can't do anything about your periods. And then you can't change your reproductive history. Some women just can't have kids and some women choose not to have kids, which is simply okay. What can we control? All right, you can control your weight. Why? Because of estrogen and progesterone, that's what breast cancer like. Guess what it's made from? It's made from cholesterol. In layman's terms, that's fat. So when you've got a lot of the beginning product, there's a pathway that it gets broken down. Steroids, androgens, estrogen, progesterone. So when you've got a lot of the beginning product, you're going to end up with a lot of the end product. And cancer cells of the breast need estrogen and progesterone. Exercise will help. Breastfeeding is protective. Minimizing the amount of alcohol, it's okay. It's needed. But too much of that <laughs> isn't great. Avoiding hormone replacement therapy. You know, hot flashes, mood swings after you go through menopause. It, it's, it's dreadful. It's dreadful for the woman and the other family members experience it too. But it, it eventually goes away. And studies have shown that women who take hormone replacement therapy for an average of five years or more increase their risk for breast cancer. Vitamin D supplements can decrease the chances for breast cancer, okay? Uh, so get your vitamin D, drink your whole milk, get out in the sun, whole milk is okay. Doesn't cause fat, we eat a lot of stuff that will make you fat, not the whole milk. Or just get your 2%, 1%, whatever the case may be, and if you're just lactose intolerant, your vitamin D supplements will be great. All right, so here are some of the things that I've heard personally from my patients and some of the things that are just out there, okay? Truths, yes, healthy diet and exercise can reduce your risk, okay? Need I say that none of this is 100%. I have patients who are lean and mean, and they get breast cancer. They exercise their body mass index is below 20, their fat percentage is really, really low. Doesn't mean that if you do these things you won't get it, but it means that the risk is much lower, okay? Drinking excess alcohol, yes, it increases your risk. Hormone replacement therapy for five years or more does definitely increase the risk. Being overweight, we already talked about the reason behind that. And breast cancer does not always show up as a lump that you can feel. Sometimes it's so small that you cannot feel it, regardless of the breast size, okay? And some cancers do show up as calcifications, meaning that you can only see it on a mammogram. And all breast cancers are not treated the same. Facebook groups are great. You get social support, but I say you've got to take away some of that information with a grain of salt. Breast cancers are all different. They can have different biologies, different sizes, and based on the woman's history, one patient's treatment for the same stage disease will be completely different from another patient's treatment. So I say take everything that has been shared on the Facebook group with a grain of salt and understand that, that what that person went through as part of their treatment may not necessarily be what you have to undergo. All right, myths. Large breast increased risk. I've got patients that say, well, is it because I have a lot of breast tissue so there was increased chance of them getting breast cancer? No. Do mammograms cause breast cancer? Okay, there's this myth out there that because mammograms expose you to radiation, they cause breast cancer. Guess what? I moved here from Arizona where it's sunshine all day, every day, 365. Here in Ohio, you guys probably get sunshine four or five months a year. Oof. It's okay. I love the warm welcome. I love the hospitality. The people here are great. My baby loves snow, so we're good. However, you still get more radiation in those four to five months than you do 
from a mammogram. So please get your mammograms annually. That means every year. Wearing a bra or a bra with an underwire can cause breast cancer. That is not true. Using deodorant causes breast cancer. It's not true. Okay? Those chemicals have been verified. All right? And I would say just talk to your doctor or you can find other more natural options to help you smell good and refreshed. Eating too much sugar? No, it doesn't cause breast cancer. Dr. Samuel loves cookies. I get a cookie at least once or twice a week. It's needed. And then breast cancer only affects older women. This is not true. We know today, based on statistics, that breast cancer affects both the young and the old. And then if you don't have a family history, you don't have to worry about it. That's also not true. I have patients who have no family history of any type of cancer at all and they show up with a diagnosis of breast cancer. All right, so what are some of the signs and symptoms? A lump on the breast, redness, thickening of the skin. We call that pitting sometimes. We call it peau de orange. Looks like the orange peel, the outside of the orange peel. You may have nipple discharge. It might be clear, yellow, green, red, pink, milky. That's the reason to talk to your PCP. Okay, and a change in color of your areola, typically it might darken, it might whiten, it might be scaly, but if it's not your usual look, that's an indication that you should call that to your doctor's attention. All right, how is breast cancer detected? So there have been some new changes per the USDF that patients can put off getting their first mammogram until they're 50. And then you can actually do it every two years. No. So the NCCN guidelines say, yes, you can start at 40, talk to your doctor. And the American Society of Breast Surgeons also recommends starting at the age of 40 and doing it every year. Why? Because we have young people who are getting breast cancer. OK? And then a woman should also get a clinical breast exam by her doctor at least once a year. Patients who are at high risk need a breast exam twice a year, preferably six months apart, okay? And then you can start doing your own self-breast exam starting at the age of 20, sort of become familiar with what your own breasts feel like. How is a breast exam done? So first I call it, you got a pose, AKA the breast inspection. You stand in front of the mirror, hands up, hands at your waist, and then your hands down. You want to see, are there any skin changes? Is there any pulling or tugging? Is there any dimpling in the breast with different types of movement? Does a certain part of the breast kind of stay t stuck to the chest wall? That's an indication that something isn't right. And if you are big breasted, you may want to lift up your breast to look underneath it. Become comfortable with yourself. And then there are several methods of doing your own self breast exam. Okay, this is a radial approach. You start from the nipple, kind of tap, 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 all the way out, tap, 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 all the way out. Am I a fan of this one? No, because guess what? You can miss the spot right in between. This is my preference. And then you can do the concentric circle. You start from the nipple and you work your way around. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that one either. This is my favorite, the lawnmower. Okay, but I actually like to start up this way. So lawnmower opposite hand across your chest wall, and you go just like this, and then you go back, and you go back. Guess what? Because you're using four fingers, and you're not just using your fingertips, okay, you are less likely to miss something, because guess what? There's overlap when you go back and forth, okay? And if your spouse can focus, guess what? They can help you do the breast exam as well. I've had women show up, and it was their husbands who found the lump, and she didn't know she had a lump in her breast. Okay, so get, get those men involved. So how do we diagnose breast cancer? So typically a woman without any symptoms, meaning she's got no lumps, no skin changes, no nipple discharge, is going to get a screening mammogram once a year. Okay, but if a woman's got a lump, she's got skin changes, she's got nipple discharge, she's got discoloration, whatever the case may be, she just feels like something isn't right. 
even breast pain, then the study that she'll be getting is a diagnostic mammogram. It's sort of like a mammogram, except that they squeeze your breast in many more directions because now they're really looking for something, okay? She may also be getting a breast ultrasound. Depending on what's seen or what's not seen, an MRI may be included as part of the investigation. And if they do see something, there are multiple ways to perform a biopsy. So there's ultrasound guided biopsy, where they use the ultrasound machine to kind of localize the mass and then get a sample of it. There's stereotactic, which basically means you're in the machine sort of like you're getting a mammogram, and a needle comes in and samples the area of concern. And if the MRI is the only way that they were able to see the concerning thing, then the woman's gonna get an MRI guided biopsy, okay? All right, so how do we treat it? Multiple, multiple options. Typically, patients get surgery first, but depending on the stage and the biology of their cancer, they may get chemotherapy first before they have their surgery, okay? But these are localized treatment options, meaning that we are working directly to treat the cancer. Surgery removes the cancer. Radiation, depending on the stage, can happen after surgery, or if it's inoperable, they don't get surgery and they get radiation. And in certain institutions, they're doing cryotherapy for certain stage diseases with certain biologies, okay? This is not heavily practiced right now, but we do do this for certain types of cancer, i.e. liver cancer. And then systemic therapy system means you're putting it into your body. There's chemotherapy. And then there's hormonal therapy. These are pills that typically either block the hormones from binding to the receptor or block the body from being able to make those hormones that breast cancer needs. And then there's more targeted therapy, which is immune therapy. And then patients also have supportive treatment. IV fluids, physical therapy, meeting with the social worker, meeting with the counselor, meeting with an exercise team to help you lose weight get back to your normal body function after having been treated for your breast cancer, and then also meeting with a dietitian to help you pick the right foods, okay? Too much of anything is bad, and too little of anything is bad as well. You gotta be like Goldilocks, just right. All right, so breast cancer survival. It is expected that across all stages, 80 to 90% of patients will have a survival of 80 to 90 percent at five years survival, okay? This literally means that these patients are cured at five years. What does that mean? That after their treatment, they've been followed up and there is no evidence of recurrent disease, meaning no evidence that the cancer came back. How come we've gotten so good? Up-to-date surgical methods. So basically less is more. We don't have to do as radical as surgery as we used to do 20, 25, 30 years ago. Those targeted therapies we talked about, and then patients undergoing genetic testing. So depending on your insurance, there are different indications to get genetic testing if you have breast cancer. Typically they think that it's not, you know, well if you're older then yeah, it's okay because you live long enough you should get it. Then you probably don't have a gene mutation. And that if you're younger than 50, because you're young, you probably shouldn't have gotten it, so maybe you do have a gene mutation. As a member of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, we highly encourage all patients, regardless of age, to get genetic testing. Why? Some of my patients who are over 60 have had a gene mutation that increased their risk for breast cancer. Okay? So what can we say? We can just say it's a low penetrance gene meaning that it just took them a while to get the breast cancer, and if they're 64 and their moms live to be 90, well, guess what? They're probably gonna live to be 100, and with a gene mutation, they've got an increased risk compared to the average population of the breast cancer coming back again, either in the same breast or in the opposite breast. So those are patients who would probably benefit from bilateral, meaning the removal of both breasts, bilateral mastectomies. And then chemo's gotten a lot better. We're able to reduce the toxicity that 
the patients experience, although they still experience some toxicity, chemotherapy, think of it as like a nuclear weapon. You're trying to get bad guys, but you're going to get some civilians too. So we're targeting cancer cells, but we're going to get your good cells. And your good cells are the rapidly dividing cells because cancer cells are also rapidly dividing. The cells that divide rapidly are your hair, your nails, your nerves, your GI tract. That's why people have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, neuropathy, and such things. And then muscle aches. Okay, we've got physical therapy that helps reduce some of those side effects from surgery. And then we've got a multidisciplinary team. A multidisciplinary team means oncologists and experts. So your breast surgeon, your medical oncologist, your radiation oncologist, the social worker, our oncology navigator. Okay, they all come together to say, here is what this patient has. Here is her life outside of her disease. And this is how this disease is impacting her life. Or this is how whatever she's got going on in her life is impacting her ability to go through treatment of her disease and we try to make it work for that patient. Okay, there are resources out there to help patients so that we can get them back to their quality of life. Okay. All right, so what is survivorship? You're a survivor essentially from the time of your diagnosis to treatment and then the remainder of your life. What does survivorship care entail? The goal is to keep the patient from getting any new cancer, okay, or recurrent cancer and its late effects. And then screening patients so that, God forbid, if they get the cancer again, we catch it early. Okay, and then the other parts of the treatment that affect the patient's survivorship. What are some of the psychosocial, physical, and immunologic effects? It's not on here, but let's not forget sexual health and intimacy. Okay, chemotherapy can cause infertility. Chemotherapy can cause vaginal dryness. Chemotherapy can cause your hair to fall out and patients don't feel attractive anymore. And the lack of that feeling, that self-esteem can impact the relationship they have with their spouses, friends, and their children. All right, so what's the screening? So really, at minimum once a year. But depending on the additional treatments that patient has to go through, they may be seen up to four times a year, clinically, and for five years, okay? For the average patient who had breast cancer, she can have a mammogram every 12 months, so just go back to the normal screening. For patients with high-risk cancers, or dense breast tissue, or other clinical findings, they may need more than just a mammogram every 12 months. They may need an MRI as well. That's a conversation that needs to be had with your breast surgical oncologist, your medical oncologist, or your radiation oncologist. If you had breast reconstruction, meaning they removed the entirety of the breast tissue and you've got either implants or autologous reconstruction. Autologous means they took tissue from somewhere else in your body to reconstruct your breast then you do not need a mammogram anymore unless you notice something new, a new lump, pain, or skin changes from that reconstructed breast, then we may need to investigate it, okay? For patients who don't have any signs or symptoms that the cancer has come back, there's no reason to do additional testing to see, oh, is it somewhere else in the body? It's not indicated. And sometimes if you get those tests done and your insurance doesn't pay for it, then you have these really high out-of-pocket costs. And you can't blame your doctor because you asked for it. All right, thanks a lot for your attention and your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, ma'am. mammography from 40 years old to 50 years old. Is yes, they've already put that out. It's they've not already, even a consideration. 
It's a recommendation. But is it set in stone? No. You're still going to get it at 40 and once a year. Well, I question because I myself have two daughters, and they're mm -hmm. saying, you know, you see younger and younger people mm -hmm. who are, you know, presenting with this, and we have no history, and, you know, all those good things, everything looks great, but I wonder why there isn't a consideration of actually moving that forward instead of backwards. What do you mean? Meaning, so like younger starting at 30? 30, at 25 or 30, why don't they look for it sooner than, than they do? So here's the thing. The age of 40 wasn't like something they picked out. It was based on research and looking at the average age of when these women get breast cancer. Okay? However, there are recommendations for younger patients, right? Because even though we've got this resource, we do want to use it appropriately. Younger patients should start getting their screening depending on their family history. If they had a mother, aunt, grandmother, multiple family members, they should see a specialist to determine what their risk is. If their mom was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 45, then they need to start their screening 10 years younger than when mom was diagnosed. So they should start at 35, okay? If they have a gene mutation, such as the BRCA, we call it BRCA1 or 2, or any other gene mutations, then they should be starting their screening at the age of 25 because they're more likely to get breast cancer at a younger age than they are to get later in life. And part of that screening, remember I said MRIs? Should include an MRI. Guess what else young people have? Dense breast tissue, which makes it difficult to see on a mammogram. So high-risk patients who are younger benefit from an MRI as well because we may not necessarily be able to see the suspicious abnormality on a mammogram, but the MRI is more likely to detect, de to detect it. Okay, that was a great question. All right, I have a question here. What do you think of self-test kits like 23andMe for my genetic testing? I say you need to see a specialist and get the appropriate genetic testing. Number one, if you do the test, can you actually interpret the results? No. And number three, based on your family history, you need to know what you're testing for. So there's so many genes out there, okay? There's the MTHFR gene. But guess what it increases your risk for? For blood problems, homocystinemia. And then you get that, so how does that help you? So it really depends on your family history and what you're really concerned about. I would say see a specialist, because with those test results and the proper genetic testing laboratory, which is verified, we can make clinical decisions based on those results. We cannot make clinical decisions based on 23 Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Sure. So you can reach me in multiple ways. You can call my office, 937-438-8600. You can actually also email me. It's S-E, S is in Sam, E is in Egg. S is in Sam, A is in Apple, M is in Mama, U is in Umbrella, E is in Egg, Lee is in Lima, at Premier Health, so it's at the bottom of the screen, dot com. I am located at two locations. So primarily my office is at the Miami Valley South location, which is in Centerville. I operate out of the South location, and I operate out of the main location. Okay. Anything else? Awesome. Thanks a lot, y'all. Yeah.